Thank you very much for uh, for your invitation and thank you for the for the question. Uh, just before starting, just uh, precision. So it, it's true that I'm chairing the ESLAC, but of course I'm not here uh, representing ESLAC, and so I'm I will really mainly rely on my experience uh, in opening access in France uh, for a long time now. Uh, and also my experience at European level, be, as I have been involved in many uh, European discussions, also involved in uh, several uh, European projects and currently coordinating a Nidan project. So I hope I will have some time to to solve. So if you can perhaps um, uh, share some slides, I would very quickly use them, but very quickly. Uh, okay, so let's start the next slide, please. So uh, next, uh, uh, so uh, I will first. Uh, I think it's important to to, um, to discuss about uh, how to improve the access in Europe to official microdata and administrative data. To have in mind uh, the uh, main difference between the countries, uh, where we have national uh, statistical system based on registers. This is a case in uh, in uh, northern countries, in Netherlands also. Uh, it's kind of in Denmark, for instance, Norway, I think. Uh, and in other countries, as France, it's not the case. And I think this is the main uh, thing to have in mind, because, of course, in, in the case of France, uh, we, are not, we have a national statistical system which is not based on register, which means that official microdata and administrative data are under different data holders and legal systems. Uh, and so opening access uh, of course, in, uh, uh, means that you have two process difference that are not linked, and so it makes it a little more difficult, probably. However, this is uh, probably perhaps it's changing in the future, uh, following the general trend that we have in Europe, uh, and it, we, we, within the European statistical system, but also at the international level, uh, the National Statistical Office in any way are increasingly using administrative data to enrich servers and censuses, so perhaps in the future, this is going perhaps to change. To change. Okay, so that's the current context in France that you have. We have okay, so what's the state of play very briefly in France? Uh, I think that, well, over the last 20 years, perhaps that starting at the end of the 90s, where I started to be involved in that, uh, we have been successful in, in widely implementing access to uh, what you call, call confidential or granular data. Granular data is a, a wide, um, uh, for instance, it's used by the central banks, for instance, so it's not only personal data, it's not only business data, it's kind, all kinds of granular data. Uh, so we currently have an access to practically all the official microdata, which are the data from the National Statistical Office uh, in C, and most of uh, what we call the SSM, which are the statistical services in the ministry. Most of the services have, uh, ministries have such statistical service where they have a, a lot of surveys also. Uh, also administrative data, but this is another story. So first we have opened that. We also have uh, been able to have, uh, to develop uh, access to other granular data, especially the tax data, which are very important. Uh, administrative data from several ministries, various administrations and other government agencies, for instance, uh, an employment agency, this is very important. Uh, and uh, recently we have opened access to the granular data for the central bank. And uh, it's also op uh, we also provide access to the medical administrative data. These are also accessible to other type of, 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 of providers. What, one thing that is very important is that we have been able to open. So it's uh, first it, first we started to open access to the, what we call the de facto anonymized. So it's not the granular data. It's what the equivalent of what is now called scientific use. So here I will really focus on the granular data. So just the de identified data. Uh, so what is very important, I think, in, this, in the case of France is we have been able to uh, to provide an access. Uh, so please, uh, you, you have moved a, a slide before. Um, could you uh, go to the next slide, please, here? Because you have, so uh, we, this is done with, uh, thank you. 
so uh, we have a, an access without silos between sources and, and domains. So why is it? So the access is in large part outsources to uh, CISD services, which is a third trust party only involved in providing access. Uh, so it provides secure ac remote access to the confidential data. Uh, and authorization is also uh, in large part uh, under an independent authority, so it's not the service as there, which is shared by a judge with uh, the data holders at board together with representative of the parliament, but also of the unions and of researchers. We have two researchers sitting there. And there is also a portal uh, which is held in cooperation between the CISD and the, and the uh, authority in charge of accreditation, which facilitates applications. And very important, uh, there are linkage possibilities for research, also using with the possibility to use, this is recent, uh, to use the, what we call the near, which is the na national identity number that we have in France and that allow to, uh, to, uh, to, to bridge a number of administrative data with the surveys and, uh, and the administrative data between them. So how was this achieved? Very briefly, so next slide, please. So of course, first, we had to change the various legal frameworks. This is still something that is ongoing. However, and we started, uh, uh, well, we had, um, it, 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 it means that we had a lot of effort to do that, but yes, we changed the law, the law. And very frequently I heard, I hear, researchers saying it's not possible to, to possible to change the loan. It is possible. Of course it requires time, efforts, but it is possible. You, you can you have changed we you have we have changed in legal form everywhere and so not why not for this? So we change a lot of law. We had to change different frameworks, the official the statistical law, uh, the privacy protection law. This is also uh, there is connection of course with the GDPR but we changed it before. Uh, the archives law because we have all, uh, all the government data including the administrative one and the data from the official and the national statistical office are under the national R. There is specific law for medical administrative data. Uh, and then we also had the change on the um, specifically focus on administrative data in the digital law very recently. And very recently this year, uh, for the, um, the possibility to uh, access uh, for linkage with administrative data for research purpose. So we did a lot of changes. And uh, next slide, please. If you look at, well, this graphic, uh, one thing is important to have in mind is that you see that in the middle, you see the creation of the CISD. And of course, uh, we had to change uh, the legal framework, especially to create this CISD because it was the access. We need to have provision for, for research persons in the statistical law. But as soon as we have created this uh, creation, has also forced after that uh, the possibility to uh, to open uh, more widely the access and to change the other, uh, other legal framework. So th there is this link between the change, the security, uh, and the, the possibility to change the legal framework. I, th I think that this is important to have in mind. So next slide, please. Uh, so security was re and security, but not only security service providing services were at the core, I think, of this de development in my experience. Uh, so um, talking about security, uh, we were able to set up a, a first remote pilot for the remote access. So this was initially set up by the National Statistical Office, and I think that. But in France, uh, the support of the National Statistics uh, Office was very important to, 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 for that. Uh, and then uh, we, we found some money to, uh, for, uh, um, for developing the first development of a consortium uh, involving the National Statistical Office and, uh, and the CNRS, which is the main research institution in France and several other universities. And since uh, three years now, four years, uh, uh, CISA is a, um, an independent institution with a legal uh, status and in CISA is at board, but not alone. Uh, with also the research. 
Uh, and so CIS is acting as a trust third party for secure access between the data producers uh, and the researchers. Uh, and so it provided a number of services. And I think that this is also very important. So not only an integrated secure remote access system, which is only accessible with a dedicated SYN client, uh, but also um, metadata harmonized under the EDI uh, with theory for the data and links to the publication. So it provides also feedback for, to, for, to the data, uh, data producers. Uh, we also enroll and train the researchers about a problem of confidentiality. And uh, CIZ is, uh, um, is doing the output check uh, and uh, depending on the agreement or with the data holder, sometimes it's also automatic exports and there is also a check before after. And very important, is it can also act as a third party for data linkage. So currently, uh, there are more than uh, 500 data sources from multi-domain, multi-producer, uh, including the tax data, the health data, uh, including the medical administrative data. And since 2022, uh, the data from the central bank that researchers can also um, combine with the uh, uh, data from the National Statistical Office, a number of research requires. <laughs> Uh, so it facilitates multi-domain research without silos, and very important, it's also available from all the EU countries, also for the, from the UK, and with some restrictions from North America, so not for all the data, and with restrictions on, this, on the research, on researchers. So next slide, please. Uh, and so this is a really... Uh, a short overview of the system, but I think it, uh, it's not very important. So uh, it's just important to say that it is only accessible. So we we use a SYN client. This is not diff different from, for instance, from a, a Netherlands system where I use a computer of the research. And it's not dependent, it integrates so it's that it doesn't depend on the local IT and it's certified. So next slide, please. And so, uh, so it was a long but successful process, I think. I think that my, um, I would say that it was based very much on involving the senior researchers who have been very uh, frequently keys in this process because they, they have built relationships with the data providers. They have started so very frequently using the data. So I think that the evolving was very, uh, very important. We have been able to use the audience of the National User Council. I think that this is also very important. It has been very helpful in many occasions, even at the, at the start and even now. Uh, very important has been the, well, the process to build trust with the data producers and the authorities in charge of data protection. I remember that in the 90s, we have really awful uh, relationship with the national authority in charge of privacy protection. This is now totally changed, I think. Uh, and so it means that we now have a, we, we have built a framework for cooperating also for changing the legal frameworks. It means that we, we have worked together, researchers, national authorities, and the National Statistical Office and data producers to change the legal framework. This has been very effective, I think. Uh, especially well, for changing the legal frameworks, for convincing the data holders. And so at the core of that was sec security at the core and high level service providers. So both are, have been very important. So next slide, please. And so this important, I think that even since the beginning, practically, this was true for the discussion about the scientific use file. And very rapidly, when we had this first agreement with the National Statistical Office for access to the confidential data, uh, they say yes uh, for access across board within Europe. Uh, so this is important. So see on the map, you see the SD box, <laughs> the same client. And this means also, next slide, please. So of course, it's just, uh, uh, it, it means that we have much more. We have more, I think, that there are 200 access now in, in, within Europe. Uh, but it also means that there are multinational projects possible. It means that researchers are able 
uh, to access the same uh, when you are, once you are authorized with a, a project to uh, to access the data from different countries, researchers can sit on in their different countries and work to the, to, together in the same research environment provided. So this is very important. Uh, so this is the situation in France. And so next slide, please. So I think it's a transition to uh, the, the, the second part. Uh, so it is first, it is possible to do that. So how to progress in Europe? Uh, I, I was from there, we had discussion, especially uh, in between uh, 2011 and 2015, uh, in the Data Without Boundary project, I was coordinating this uh, this project uh, on that focused on access to confidential microdata across borders. Uh, so we did an overview of the legal aspects, uh, and uh, we had discussion on the on the, the important role of security and building trust at the core of that. Uh, we we very uh, rapidly uh, uh, have seen that remote access was the preferred access by researchers this versus remote execution and we try we built a pilot for secure remote access across the borders to data sources from different countries which could allow also pooling the data when necessary uh, in the same time, we had parallel discussion with and within the European statistical system with the first achievement because at this time the problem was also to access the European microdata, those uh, from Eurostat who, who gather the data uh, service from di different uh, member states. And it was only possible for scientific use files that are not uh, that are too anonymized for research. And so we got a final regulation after two years of discussion in 2013, uh, and uh, the possibility in the, in the regulation to have secure use files and the possibility of a distributed remote access from the university. However, it took 10 years until it was really implemented. It is now implemented at the end of, uh, of the last year. Uh, and at the moment, only for two surveys. But, uh, so it took time, but it is possible. Uh, however, uh, it's more difficult uh, for the administrative data that are under different stakeholders, and especially they are not under the European statistical system. However, I think that we have a favorable context currently, which is a moving context also, because there is the EU, EU data policy and what we call the European data space, with a number of legal acts and initiatives. So of course, we, you have a GDPR, but it provides, uh, of course, there are some constraints. However, it provides a European framework for access to personal data within the EU, EU uh, for research and with, with countries countries that are in line with adequation decision for the GDPR. Uh, we have the Data Governance Act now on harmonized rules on fair access and use of data. So this also is a favorable framework. Uh, it is in discussion now uh, at, uh, at the parliament. I hope it will be uh, adopted before the change of the of our parliament and the elections. It's called the uh, e e e uh, European Commission 223 regulation. So this is for the European statistical system. And there is a focus was on access to private data, but there is also an, a more focus on transmission of administrative data uh, to Eurostat. So this is also something that is increasing uh, the possibility to access. So in the, in the two to three, there is not, of course, there is a general provision on access for research. There is nothing on the provision for access to administrative data, but we can expect from, uh, from this change that it would, should facilitate at the end. There is a trend to, towards um, more access. And there are regularly, uh, there are um, recommendations, ESGAP is the, uh, is the other governance body uh, uh, which is on, on best practices that have a peer review every uh, every year of all the National Statistical Office and also of Eurostat, and there are recommendations on access to official microdata. And there are some uh, recommendations. They are also aware that researchers are increasingly uh, interested in using the administrative data that are deep, well, in, in registered country, they have access in other not, and, and there is an increasingly use of administrative data. 
However, uh, secure, secure remote access uh, still, is still in slow development if I look at the current uh, landscape. And even when it is uh, implemented, it's frequently restricted to national borders. And so I will come to my last point. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so within this context, uh, uh, at OECSD and some partners that have been working in the DWB project, we tried, uh, we, we had an initiative, now it's for four, for five years, and it's a collaboration between uh, five research data centers from four countries to foster the remote access across borders to granular data in general, and particularly uh, the administrative one. And so allowing researchers to work remotely on data provided by partners countries. Next slide, please. So this is a map. <laughs> if you go to the, the where you see what uh, the, the, the partners involved for the moment. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so it's based on quick wins. So what it means, it means that we really try to concrete moving, so not having in mind to change everything. Uh, so we just uh, concrete development that will demonstrate output for research and build trust, which I think is very important to really move forward. So it's based on best efforts and partner resources. It's not a European uh, Commission. We don't have more resources. Uh, it's uh, and the idea is a quick win me that uh, we 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 started uh, the idea is to implement all the access points of the different partner which are different system in all partners premises as a first step so it means that we we call that Eden safe rooms. Uh, so there is no multilateral agreement. This is done by bilateral contracts. Accreditation and output checking remain in the data provider's hands according to their procedure, even if we know from DWB that uh, the principles are rather the same and we could harmonize that. But by experience, it's very, it takes a long time to discuss this. So we started this way. And so it's not uh, an integrated technical system because this would require for the partners, first you need to, to build such, such a, a system, but then it means that we, uh, the partners would not, uh, they will of course keep their own system. And so they will have to manage two systems and to articulate them. So uh, this I think is really problematic and complicated. And however, even if we don't, do not have this articulated system, we I think that it could allow if we have requests for that, pulling the data if necessary, because we have, for example, the example of a Norman project uh, between the uh, experience with, with between, I think, four Nordic or five Nordic countries, where they, uh, based on their agreements, uh, they were able to send the data to uh, their partner, the trusted partners, uh, if the researchers wanted to pull the data from the two different countries. So the expectation is that within this project, uh, if we had such re such demand, we would be able to build such agreement uh, between our country because we have we have built the trust. So next slide, and this will be the last one. Uh, yes. Uh, so this is just to uh, to, to show on uh, on the figure. You see that in the uh, in the premises of each Eden partner, uh, researchers uh, could could look at the, at the data from the different country, but of course not in the same research environment. But it would be easier for for them to find all the access points in the same place. So next slide, please. Uh, and so this is the situation, for instance, at Gezis, you see that uh, there is an access implemented in Mannheim and researchers could then uh, access the different uh, data sets. And so final, uh, fi next slide, please, for the conclusion. So what have been the achievements so far? So we have the partner's access point implemented in practically all the partner's premises. We have a portal uh, to partner's data catalogs and partner's procedures for accreditation and access. We ha have tried to put some harmonized information on partner's procedures. And we had reached an agreement on security requirements for the Eden Safe Room, which was, of course, in, uh, important because we put the access, all the access points in the same premises. So of course we need to we had to uh, to agree on the security. 
uh, we have procedures now in place and we have ongoing research projects. And uh, we, between IB in, uh, in Nuremberg and CISD in Paris, uh, we had worked uh, for documenting some comparable administrative data that we have on both sides. So what are the first lessons that I, I think that we can get from that? Uh, uh, sorry, could you please... Put the, yes, uh, I missed the... I'm sorry, <laughs> yes. I messed it up. <laughs> okay. But we, we are over time already. Yes, I will Oksana. just finish with my, uh, uh, my, my final conclusions. Yeah. So if you can, yeah. Yeah. okay, yeah. Okay, so the first lesson is that it's, it's very long uh, discussion with the legal department. So even if we have, uh, a, a European context of that, if we do, ha, do not have legal issues, it's very different. Uh, but we, it's, time, it's time to get the, the, the contract with the legal department. What is important, I think, is that so far, we didn't have so much uh, request, and even known requests from, uh, um, from researchers to access data from, the, from several countries. M most of the research, practically all of the research, of, uh, projects, we can access from only one uh, one, uh, one uh, um, country. So I think that the lack of comparability or lack of documentation on comparable administrative data is certainly a main obstacle. And so I think that, well, it's, it's, it's good to discuss about uh, um, how to improve the access, but I'm not sure what are the real needs about administrative data. And so currently we are just, so just to finish, uh, now Eden is in the process of enlarging uh, the, uh, the, the network in two directions with other data providers, other countries, and also a second type of partners, the research centers, uh, that would host the access point based on the same agreements and in counterparts uh, with contributions to identify uh, and document the comparability of administrative data. And so we are thinking, discussing a pilot uh, currently. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roxanne, for this fascinating presentation. And it's very nice that you have started because now we are going to, to hear uh, also an, an example of data infrastructure by Tom Emery. Tom is uh, the director of Odyssey, the Dutch National Infrastructure for Social Science and associate professor in the Department of Public Administration and Sociology of Erasmus University, Rotterdam. Tom, could you tell us a bit about Odyssey and what has been the process of building up a truly impressive open data infrastructure for social science? What does it offer and what are your plans for the future? Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Daniela. And uh, it's, it's really fascinating to see Roxanne's kind of very detailed description of all the legislative changes that they had to go through in the complex process. I took the lazy option when it came to administrative data access and just moved to a country that had really good administrative data access. So, it, which is the Netherlands. I come from the UK where it's a similar situation to France, but in the Netherlands, it's, it's, it's a bit simpler in terms of uh, access. And they've been providing a, a access to administrative data for, for quite a long time. Um, so as Daniela said, I'm the director of the Dutch National Infrastructure for Social Science uh, and Economics, which is called Odyssey. Uh, we have 45 member organizations, which includes all the social science faculties in the Netherlands and economics faculties, and they all pay a, a membership fee. Um, and for that, we provide services to those uh, membership organizations to support social research. And that gives us an ongoing operational budget, about a million euros per year to, to provide those services. And then on top of that, we supplement and develop new services through, through grants and uh, innov innovation investments from the, the Dutch Funding Council. So, so that's basically how we work. And it develops this kind of nice virtuous circle of, of placing investments in new technology that we can then deliver to the membership organization and provide a sustainable uh, research infrastructure for all kinds of different data infrastructure of which administrative data access is, is an important part, but it's not all of what we do. And I'll touch on that a little bit later. But today, I just want to give you a, a glimpse of what we do, especially in that space of administrative data access. Um, so the key people that we work with in um, our field are Statistics Netherlands, and we work with them to provide access to administrative data through their secure remote access environment, which uh, Roxanne actually mentioned before. We use secure VPN connection. You can access this data from anywhere in the EU. And there's thousands of files in there. It's a bit like a big data lake. So there's data on health 
employment, education histories, all these different kinds of uh, data files in there. Uh, and it's been increasingly uh, used over the last 15 years to around 400 uh, projects per year now that start in this uh, remote access environment. And we work very closely with CBS to try and improve the functionality and make sure it actually supports researchers in the types of questions they want to answer. And actually, we've got quite a few administrative data users in the room. I've seen quite a few of you out there. And actually, one of the things that is, uh, I think we all share in common is that we're very frustrated by the computational capacity that quite often sits behind uh, a lot of these environments. It's actually quite restricted because this data, it's not only large, but it's very complex. There's lots of relational data in there. And your memory gets very uh, crammed up very quickly. And some of the more complex analysis you want to run takes days and days and days. Quite a lot of researchers using these environments will literally sit there for a week waiting for a model to run and then you get the results at the end but it, it takes a, a long time a, a long time for these models to actually uh, run uh, so what we did in odyssey was we actually made it possible to connect this administrative data to the national um, uh, supercomputing facility at surf and we call this uh, an enclave the odyssey secure supercomputer and this has really changed the types of research that researchers can do with the administrative data so, for example, they can do GWAS analysis with the administrative data uh, linked, or they can do very high resolution geospatial analysis. Or one of the big things that's really changed lots of different research streams is we've actually created a population network that links everybody in the Netherlands to all their family members. We have one family tree of the Netherlands now, uh, all their colleagues, all their neighbors, all their uh, classmates, and you can actually see how social behaviors actually uh, pass through society and across these different types of relationships. So, for example, we were able to study, we linked it with the COVID test data, and we could actually see the transmission across different types of relationships uh, in society. So lots of different applications. And it's really uh, been a big challenge to train researchers how to use these kinds of facilities. So not a lot of social science programs include a module on how to use a supercomputer. So we've had to train those uh, individuals in how to do so, how to parallelize their work, uh, and how to organize their workflows in this completely new way that they're not used to and accustomed to working with. Plus a whole new range of statistical uh, techniques and methods that they, they just weren't uh, equipped with in graduate school. So there's a huge amount of training that goes on alongside this. The bit that makes the Netherlands really unique though, so Odyssey also finances what's uh, called the list panel. Some of you may know this, and what makes this really special in relation to administrative data is it's linkable at the individual level. So the list panel has been running for 40 uh, years and it has a representative a sample of 7,500 individuals and they're linkable at the individual level with the CBS administrative data. So you can do things in a survey and then link that to the administrative data. So you get the best of both worlds. So during COVID, for example, we had a lockdown. And so we ran some really nice modules on things like homeschooling. So how homeschooling was actually going on at home uh, in terms of uh, access to computers, how much time they were spending on homeschooling per day, all these different kinds of things. And what's really exciting is you can link that data to administrative data and track what happens to those children in the long run without having to go back and re-interview them uh, in, a, in a survey context. So there's lots of different interesting research questions that we open up by having both the, the really nice long, long-term administrative data and the 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 capacity for researchers to field their own questions via an open panel such as the list panel. And this, I think, is unique to the Netherlands. But this has really changed the types of questions we, we've opened up. And it's also changing how we think about um, the survey itself, the list panel, and how it's structured. And so if we link it to that population network data that I was talking before, we can actually say how many path, uh, what's the path length between list respondents, for example. So you need to go 4.5 moves through that population network that I referred to, referred to before to actually get to between list respondents. We want to design the list sample in the future so we can actually reduce those path lengths and use the survey to study network behaviors and actually uh, social dynamics in a much more flexible way. And this changes the types of questions we as researchers can answer. And this is a facility that is not available anywhere else in the world at the minute. So it'd be really kind of groundbreaking research that we'd be able to support. But this is a really cool event. I'm very uh, happy that Population Europe is running this event today. I think the timing is perfect because I also wanted to make a mention to a paper that's not from the, from the Netherlands, uh, but that came out just before uh, Christmas, uh, which I think is really gonna change how we do administrative data analysis. This is a paper that was published in Nature Computational Science, and it's the training of a large language model uh, looking at life sequences and administrative data. And this is a general model trained on administrative data. 
So they're not just predicting one thing, like most models in the social sciences, they actually use it to predict a variety of things. In this case, they looked at death and uh, psychological traits, which really is, is something that we've not been doing in the social sciences before. And this is only possible because of the highly relational, high dimensional nature of administrative data and the computational requirements needed for this kinds of research are very different to what we've done before. Now, in this case, what they did was very pragmatic, but I don't know if it's necessarily scalable. They just bought a GPU and plugged it in at uh, Statistics Denmark. Whereas what we're trying to do is create an infrastructure to make this broadly available to the research community. But I refer to this as a kind of Sputnik paper because they've really kind of broken a, a new ground and, and really opened up a whole new area of research in, in administrative data analysis, which is very exciting. But there's a huge amount of what we could do it, uh, going along this kind of uh, route. So looking forward to an infrastructure that can support this uh, kinds of research going forward in the future. So in the in the Danish paper, this is actually the, 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 the data that they used in this study, uh, all the different kind of data points. Actually, we could probably ex uh, extend that out and also see for what outcomes such a model does work and it is good at predicting and which isn't and for what kinds of people the models do work and which they don't. So what is the actual functionality of these kinds of models? Also, we want to be able to make those models portable. So Roxanne was referring to international data access. But what about actually the portability of models, not necessarily data across borders? And that is a challenge that we're going to have to build infrastructure to, to rise to. And also this kind of data doesn't build on the, the real richness of the administrative data, which, as I mentioned before, is the relationship between individuals, those population network data. So not just looking at individual sequences, but how those sequences relate to each other. And that will be possible with the kind of next generation of data infrastructure that we're looking to develop. So this is a bit of a call to action uh, is my final point, which is to say what we really need, we've had the, the Sputnik paper as it were, and what you need now is this moonshot uh, kind of call to action, looking for a, a kind of data infrastructure that will support this new generation of research. And a, particularly at the European level, uh, uh, collaborative, <clears throat> collaboratively trying to bring this uh, burgeoning administrative data community together. So. That's my uh, presentation. If you have any questions on Odyssey, though, I didn't spend much time on it. Feel free to check out our website, follow us on all the usual places. Thank you so much, Tom. It's fascinating what we're doing and uh, all you you brought for for this you brought to this panel today. Thank you. Uh, our next next speaker is Siri. Holbeck. She is director of the Center for Fertility and Health, a center of excellence founded by the Norwegian Research Council. Siri, you, can you give us an example of what can be achieved when it's possible to combine register data with cohorts and biosamples, and why this is so important to make it easier for um, to make it easier to do for all the scientific community? Yes, thank you. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to this. Um, so I will talk a little bit about uh, my experience in combining data from the registries and the cohort studies and uh, also using Biobank uh, uh, to do research. And um, uh, as Dr. Emery just mentioned, uh, the Nordic countries, uh, Denmark and uh, also Norway, where I am uh, uh, seated, is um, the possibility to use actually the whole country as uh, a cohort and study the whole, the complete uh, population of a country. And this was recognized already 25 years ago, as you can see in, in science, as a um, quite unique and important research resource that could be um, very important to, to um, uh, contribute to knowledge. And what we have uh, in common in the Nordic countries is that we have uh, a population register for the whole population covering uh, data and gathering data, administrative data from birth uh, uh, until death on a lot of different uh, aspects. And uh, this is sort of keeping track of the whole population um, and how we change status uh, during life. And uh, then we have Statistics Norway uh, or statistics in the countries that we uh, have all kinds of information used for all different purposes, uh, education, uh, grades, uh, taxes, uh, 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 we have immigration data, country of birth, and also housing conditions, and also family structures, so we can uh, see how people relate to each other and, um, and uh, uh, create families for our research. And then we have all the health registries. We have uh, different kinds, specialist care, primary care, vaccination, prescription, cancer registries, uh, cause of death and birth registries. 
industries and also uh, which we used a lot now during the uh, pandemic um, infectious disease registry so this together is a great resource uh, of course uh, these are not consent based these registries so they are, are um, heavily legislated but it's possible to uh, use all of this data and research so as you can see in the corner uh, Norway is way up there a population of a total 5.5 million people so it's not that big of a cohort you might say a big of a country but in addition to the national registries which capture absolutely everyone uh, we have uh, many different uh, cohort studies in Norway. So uh, many of them are quite large and cover most of the Norwegian uh, country, as you can see from this uh, uh, mobile study, the Norwegian mother, father and child cohort study, pregnancy cohort. We have a, a called a hunt study, which is a region in uh, Norway in the middle there. You can see marked in red. Uh, with 250,000 participants. And then we have another reg regional study. And as you can see, there are several uh, cohort studies that also sample uh, biosamples. And altogether, we are around more than 1 million. So a fifth of the country are participating in some sort of uh, survey, a, a study with questionnaires. And also many have provided biosamples with also a lot of genotyping already being uh, performed. So this is a great resource um, for re uh, research. And the key in the Nordic countries, uh, which I guess is kind of unique, is that we have all the way back from 1964 in Norway, when this was established um, in the population registry, a unique pin that follows you throughout life in all these databases and also in the cohort study. So everyone uh, who is a citizen of Norway get this uh, pin and uh, also all uh, people who are immigrating to Norway get this personal identification number. So this is uh, makes it possible to link across the surveys, find the biosamples and it's a very, um, a specific and secure linkage. So this infrastructure, we have the registries with the whole population. We have the uh, core studies for parts of it, a fifth of the population, the biobanks, but we also have clinical research databases that are driven by hospitals or more localized uh, registries. And all of these can then be part of the big infrastructure. Um, I will just give an example of how we can use and combine all of this. And, uh, 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 this is within my own personal interest, of course. It's um, uh, use of assisted reproductive technologies and uh, all the aspects around that. And uh, one of my main research uh, interests is whether or not uh, this has an implication for the well, for the population, but also for the children who are born after ART, uh, and also trying to improve and, and identify sort of the safest methods. But uh, we did... Uh, um, uh, start uh, or we did do some of this work just using the birth registry where all the ART, so the assisted reproductive technologies birth in Norway are registered. And uh, this is uh, used for research, but also for administrative purposes. And we have all the clinics in Norway that perform this kind of procedures so fill in this form that you see in yellow and send it to the medical birth registry of Norway. So we have all the ART births in Norway since the first one in 1984 in this registry. And you can see from the sources there um, that it's not only from this form, you also ask women when they deliver and there are several other ways of capturing everyone in Norway who has given birth after a conception with ART. And uh, from this, we can, for example, just follow the number of, uh, of births throughout the years or the, here the proportion of births, which is uh, actually quite uh, st uh, steeply increasing because the, also the denominator is going down as the uh, number of births in total are going down. Uh, so this is interesting just to follow the birth. And um, uh, of course it's availability in here as well, uh, but also in parallel with increasing parental age. Um, and we published this uh, paper together with the demographers uh, and uh, also clinicians in the fertility clinics, just lo looking at the different demographics of, uh, in Norway on how this is um, uh, distributed. And even in Norway, where this is subsidized, we concluded that um, uh, there are still uh, persisting uh, social inequalities in the use of ART in Norway. And, uh, at the same time, it may seem that the ART children are selected in a way with a positive sort of higher socioeconomic um, position. So that could benefit their development and well being. So that was one example. And then uh, another pressing question I would say is that we see that children who are born after ART have a higher risk of 
some adverse outcomes. There are a high risk of pregnancy complication. Uh, it influences birth weight in various ways, uh, preterm delivery, birth defects, and imprinting disorders. And then there are questions whether or not uh, children are at, in risk use of several other health outcomes, which is not quite established. And there are some mixed results. So this is still an area of research. And if there um, uh, are differences, is it really due to the methods or is it, is it a selection of those uh, couples who are using ART? And what has been discussed is whether or not some of this uh, mechanism could go through epigenetics. And I will not explain too much about the epigenetics, but it has to do with the regulation of uh, DNA and uh, genes. And we have uh, studied this in Norway, but by combining the birth registry data with uh, questionnaires from this mobile study, the mother and father and child cohort study uh, from the parents, and also then the blood samples that were given from the mother and the father and the child uh, at uh, cord blood at birth. Um, so what we did was to pick out a thousand children who were born after ART and a thousand children who were naturally conceived and their parents. And then we did measure this epigenetic signatures in, uh, in all of them, both the parents and the children. And then we compared whether or not those children who were born after ART had any differences in their epigenetic signatures compared to those who were naturally conceived. And this was published um, in 2022 and uh, uh, required a lot of resources and many people involved, they did a lot of the hard work. And uh, this is uh, just to show you what the possibilities are. And uh, with this data set and the registry information and the questionnaire information, we were able to show that actually there are some differences uh, at birth uh, in the epigenetic signatures. And we found these differences also in the genes uh, that are known to be um, associated with some of the outcomes that have been found to have differences uh, or higher risk in, in children born after T. We do not know though if these signals persist uh, into older ages or even if they are uh, related to the diseases in these children. But it's an uh, interesting way of combining all of this. So um, yeah, that was my presentation. Thank you so much, Siri. Uh, I'm, I'm just a note uh, to, uh, to, to mention that we're a bit below the schedule, but we'll catch up and we'll be a bit 10 minutes below uh, late for the breakout room, but everything is is under control, just to, to let you know. Our next speaker is Daunia Pavone. She's a senior data and, and analysis quality advocate at the International Organization for Migration, which is part of the United Nations. Daunia, you are a data quality expert working for an international organization dealing with displacement and migration, which can be a very sensitive topic. From your experience, what is the importance of ethical standards in data collection? Thank you, Daniela. Can you hear me well? Yes. Excellent. Thanks for thanks for the question. Yeah, we're we're moving a little bit geographically as well as in terms of environment. Well, where the previous speakers were we're talking um, from and what we do. Uh, I work for an organization called IOM, International Organization for Migrations, and I've worked for other international organizations and UN and NGOs before in the humanitarian sector, uh, but also within the migration um, environment. And um, I'm gonna try and give a little bit of an answer to your question. It's a difficult uh, question to answer, uh, but what is the some of, what are some of the ways in which we try to address ethical uh, issues in data management when we work uh, with, with persons, with individuals and communities? And I think the best way to start this answer is to refer to a, a concept that we borrowed from the medical profession, the do no harm, in a way simplifying it, um, making it mean that we uh, try not to do something bad while uh, trying to do something good. So do no harm is not trying not trying to do something bad voluntarily, but while we're trying to do something good, how do we avoid doing something bad. And that's really the way we often approach the issue of data management and ethical data management. So I'm going to try and give you a couple of um, really practical example of what that uh, can mean in, in the work that we do. And um, what we usually look at is 
um, the, the harm that we can do at different stages of the data cycle through data collection, data storage analysis and sharing and using, uh, but the harm that can be done to the people that are collecting the data, also the people that are answering the data or the communities they represent, as well as the organization or the staff of the organizations and others. And the practical examples I wanted to share with you um, that um, that have happened in the probably the last 20 years that I've been doing this job um, are the following. Um, if assume that you are interviewing individuals on the on the on the move migrants uh, going through a border and you ask them about violence they might have experienced. And there is a good reason to do that because we also want to know and need to know um, what is the situation of people when they move uh, and what are the, the challenges that they face. Um, and some of the survivors of violent attacks relieve their experience while answering those questions. Uh, without really the possibility to uh, have any support uh, um, when they need it and when they are going through this these interviews. Um, we also might have situations in which um, people are moving through the borders and they are asked questions about trafficking uh, in persons and some of these people might be in the process of being trafficked. Uh, and you know the, the, the risk of traffickers noticing that some people are interviewed, some other people are not interviewed, not knowing how you select people to interview might create real risks of additional violence to the people uh, who might be even uh, punished by the, by the, by the traffickers. Uh, in order to create an example, you know, about not sharing some information that ha really has nothing to do with what kind of questions uh, they answer. It's, it's more uh, about what kind of questions we, we ask. So in that case, what we usually, um, you know, what, what the example can can be linked to is really the harm that uh, data collection can do or we can do during data collection to the people, to the to displaced communities, but also to the people who answer the questions themselves. Um, another example that is more about uh, the, the harm that we can do when we, we analyze the data and if we don't analyze the data correctly, um, is really linked to, for example, when we ask questions about violations of rights and protection, we call it protection, but it's really when, viol when rights have been violated. And uh, we have had cases in, in the general humanitarian community in which um, the, the understanding of the people who answer the question and the understanding of the humanitarian workers was very different. And so um, the analysis at the end was done um, in a wrong way. And, portraying a situation in which there was no protection risk for that population, while in reality it's just that they didn't understand what we meant and we didn't know that. And so instead of looking at other data sets and uh, additional information that we had, we came out um, with, with an analysis that was incorrect. And that really created harm to the population that was in need of support to counter these violation rights and didn't get it. So this is um, these were a couple of examples. We also have a lot of examples of how we can do harm to to population, but also to our own staff uh, with um, with incorrect or uh, yeah incorrect data storage or things that we haven't thought about that we needed to um, think about beforehand. Uh, things that related to um, computers being uh, looked at or taken from us at checkpoints and, and things like that. Um, a very interesting approach that we have been uh, really developing and, and using more and more in the past 10 years is what we call data responsibility. And it's a concept that um, is shared among the humanitarian uh, organizations of uh, safe, ethical, and effective data management. And these are, these are data that are personal and non-personal uh, for our purpose, which is really not usually research, but it's operational response. Um, and the interesting uh, concept around data responsibility is that we often look at personal data as being particularly uh, sensitive data. And uh, we link often in our minds a harm that can be done specifically when we share personal data. And that's definitely true. Uh, and that's what we uh, try to um, manage through what we call data protection. 
uh, but we it's not only uh, personal data that are actually uh, potentially uh, doing harm. Um, but so we also have examples of non-personal data that can do harm. And so the, the data responsibility approach really looks at personal and non-personal data um, in a way to protect the um to protect the people we work with and we work for from any unintentional harm that can happen to them during the data management cycle. Um, there are a couple of ethical principles, there are many ethical principles, 12 in the data uh, responsibility operational guidance of the interagency standing committee, which is the, the regulating body when it comes to humanitarian work. Um, but I wanted to maybe uh, focus on two of them that are really, besides being my favorite ones, are very important. Uh, one is called defined purpose. You see them in red here, defined purpose, necessity and proportionality. And the other one is called people center and inclusive. So the data management has to be has to have a defined purpose. It has to be based on necessity and proportionality, as well as being a people center and inclusive. What does it mean? Um, interesting uh, question to to ask. Interesting questions to ask, or interesting information that we'd like to collect. Sometimes. Um, might be uh, less, might have less of a defined purpose and being just more interesting and something we think we need to know. But we, in reality, having a st standardized approach to how we collect data, what data we collect, uh, helps us un differentiate between what is interesting to know and what we really need to know in order for our response and to provide assistance and protect people. Uh, one of the examples that a lot of uh, a lot of colleagues think it's important to collect is how many uh, cases of gender-based violence there are in the community, how many persons have experienced gender-based violence, and and they you know there is there is a reason why they would like to understand that. Um, or how many victims of trafficking are there in this community? Um, but what we try to do is look at the potential harm. I gave a couple of examples before, but there are even more uh, risks that are linked to the, the this kind of questions that we ask. But there is also very little ability uh, to collect um, data that are actually uh, portraying the reality as it is in the situation where we work when we ask questions like that. So there is a there is very very um, very probably not uh, accurate data we would collect, but there is also a high level of risk of harm. So we try not to uh, to ask those questions and we try to understand what we really need to know in terms of our response. So if we want to set up um, projects to help persons who have experienced gender-based violence, we probably don't need to know the total number, but we probably need to know other things, uh, how things are, are managed in the community, what kind of risks people would be exposed to and so on and so forth. Um, so what we try to do is we try to put, you know, shift the focus on instead of what we'd like to know, but what is that we're going to do with the data? Can we do something with the data that we want to collect that we cannot do without them? Um, so trying to really focus on the defined purpose and the necessity of that data. And then what risks we are exposing people to. There is a fantastic example that you can ask uh, my colleague, Stina, who is going to be in one of the breakout rooms about uh, instead how we use um, administrative data on victims of trafficking uh, for uh, both for response and then for possible research. The other principle from the data responsibility principles I wanted to talk about briefly is the one that says people-centered and inclusive. What, what it means really in practice is that we want to ensure that the voice of the most vulnerable people in the communities that we support are heard. Uh, the voice of, for example, female-headed households, uh, the voice of children, the voice of persons with disabilities, the, person, the voice of persons with diverse sexual orientation, gender identity and expression and sex characteristics. Mm. Um, there is a little bit, and that's what SOGIESC, the acronym, means. Um, there is a little bit, we have noticed, an obsession with having quantitative data, um, which are really important, but we are seeing a devaluation of qualitative data. Um, and what some, some of my colleagues always repeat is that not everything that counts can be counted. In order to listen to the voice of diverse groups, we really need to look at qualitative data um, rather than than and trying to, to focus all our analysis and understanding of quantitative, especially because we often cannot collect accurate data and we expose people 
to risk when we do that. A very interesting uh, recent example of this conversation we had with colleagues was uh, we would like to know gender identity of the people that, uh, for example, migrants that come to Europe. And that is because we think that in that way we can better advocate and better provide services. However, the reality when we ask um, when we ask communities is that even in uh, European countries where legislation or le the, the, law, the legal framework and, and culturally uh, persons with diverse gender identity are much more accepted than maybe the countries where they're coming from, there is still um, a very high risk of harm being done to these individuals because of the way they live in communities that are often not as, um, not as um, you know, they, they don't necessarily have the same understanding of these issues, even within a European country. So even in those cases, we prefer not to ask gender identity. We're ready to uh, um, safely store and accept and, and, and safely use the disclosures if they come through but we try not to prompt any of that uh, type of information because we try to balance the risk to the real purpose and to the use that we can do of uh, data like that. Before ending this very short um, presentation, I just uh, wanted to leave you with a challenge. And I think it's a challenge that is as valid in our world uh, as much as probably in the academic world. Uh, I'm not sure, I don't live in that world, but uh, it's up to you to think about it. food for thought. We really no, have no mechanism to collect the negative impact of unethical data management on individuals and communities. And as long as we don't have that mechanism, we also kind of move as if we were a little bit in the dark. And so uh, I guess the uh, challenge here uh, is for us all to try to find a better way to make sure we understand the risk we're exposing people to and try to find ways to minimize this risk. As uh, um, as the professor uh, before Roxanne mentioned, uh, security was at the heart of all their activi activities and all their uh, initiatives. And I think that's something that uh, we all try to do. Often the challenge we have is that we don't foresee uh, all the all the risks that might um, that people communities and individuals might face as they are different and they're very um, dependent on the cultural um, uh, con context as well as the legal context where people live or come from. Over to you, Daniela. Thank you so much, Daniela, for the fascinating presentation. Uh, we have now uh, our last speaker in the in this main panel, and uh, just after Yanni uh, speaks, I'll open the, the breakout rooms. You see a window in the bottom of your screen with four options for the breakout rooms, and then you just click on the your your choice, and you'll be directed there. And ten minutes before the meeting ends, you would then come back to the main panel so we can conclude the event. Uh, we have now Yanni Erola, he is Professor of Sociology at the University of Turku, Director of the Invest Research Flagship Center and the Principal investigation, Investigator of our MAPINEC project. Yanni, you have an impressive team using Finnish and other countries' individual level registered data to produce uh, scientific knowledge. Is there uh, a registry data research community? Are there enough networks or or knowledge sharing, for example, in data coding, classification, measurements? Does it even make sense to pursue a more structured collaboration within academia? Would love to hear your perspective on that. Thanks, Daniela, uh, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, yeah, it's, I think this is a great topic, and this actually, it's really, I mean, it's its really good to hear all these uh, presentations already about these topics, and I, I think it's kind of a, my talk is probably a wrapping up a bit also and what was already said here. So if you if you think about the um, uh, registered data in general, I, I think it's what what is already quite clear that this is a, the the uses of expanding of uses of these administrative registers and also other registers. Uh, it's it's happening everywhere now, and and uh, what is also kind of a good to uh, kind of a, uh, realize 
as the, it, it's happening in very different paces in different places. So we already had serious presentation basically showing us saying, okay, that this was already commonplace stuff in the, to some extent in the 80s or definitely in the 90s in the Nordics. And then we have a French example where it's now getting there. And then, then the, 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 the Netherlands example, which is somewhere in between. And we definitely have multiple countries in Europe and elsewhere where we are, we know that there's lots of things happening, but they are not really, that's just about to happen, uh, start this. So, so this is definitely something that is happening everywhere at the moment. And, and more, I, I've been doing this most of my uh, academic career, really, and uh, using these registers and Finnish registers, especially. Uh, but now it's kind of a, becoming also for me a more and more and more apparent that this is actually the most important advancement in, in social science data, especially since the since the invention of the survey methods in the 1880s. And this is something that we I don't think we actually understand this properly. How many big changes this will be? So if you think about the just even the statistical testing we are still using, even with this registered data sets. It's based on the survey assumptions that this is entirely, I mean, they they don't really fit to this data and the idea how this data is constructed. You have full information on the population and the errors are somewhere else. They are not in the error variance. They are just uh, systematic errors in the in the estimates in the answer. That this is something entirely different that we have thought before. And, and we're just learning, beginning to kind of grasp how much this is going to change. Uh, in terms of uh, in the in in my own experience, this is definitely these registers and other data sets and making combinations of these have been really kind of a core issues of uh, core component of building projects like this mapping project that we have. Uh, also, the networks we are now uh, applying the cost network for register data in Europe, and that's uh, that that's one of the key issues. And also entire research communities. We have this uh, Invest Flagship Center that I'm running where we have 250 people working on the specific topics. But the most the, the thing that is really shared or most of them is that they, they are doing kind of a, this exceptional research based on these registers in at least in some part of their, uh, of their research. And if you think about how this thing is really developing, I think this is a kind of a three th steps that are kind of a observable here. The first one is kind of obvious. It's the expansion of interlinked register data sources, even in the countries that have already already quite far in this. I think this is something that is still going on quite a bit. The second part was something that was, I, I think Thomas already kind of a touching this part, that, that, that the register data being augmented with other sources uh, that can be contextual information like we did in the Mapinec project. Uh, that can be sample data, uh, survey data, excerpts of data, which is kind of a usual, the convenience of samples would be considered as this, or the unstructured uh, data that can be also uh, written text or legislation text or something like that. And this is something that I, I think this is a kind of a promising next change that is going to happen right now, and it's already happening somewhere. But the third thing is really that what we are not really yet seeing, we can kind of a guess that this is happening in, in the following phases, is making this synthetic combination of registers and other data sources. And this is a kind of a very little explored area of research at the moment, but I'm pretty sure that this will happen because I mean, of course, registers don't cover everything. Uh, other data sources don't cover everything. And then when you try to combine them, there will be holes. So you have to plug this hole somewhere and then, then, then the one way of it is to, to build synthetic data. And the other important part with the synthetic data is basically it's 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 basically a fabricated data, but very accurately fabricated data. So it also should solve some of the the, the privacy issues that this uh, data set that covers everybody definitely otherwise have. So this is uh, probably the third stage that we have to be prepared that it will be probably happening. So in terms of a knowledge sharing, I, I think what is really important here to uh, know that or also understand that this it's this stuff is hard and it's hard to learn and it's not really taught anywhere extensively, not even in the Nordic countries where we have done this uh, longest time. Uh, the methods and the classifications, data ranging, ethics parts, everything has actually done something on that, but but this is kind of a it's good to know that there's actually experiences, but then nobody knows all the stories. So there's definitely uh, uh, reasons for knowledge sharing. Uh, the privacy rules that we need to really, like in the previous presentation, we it's good to 
uh, was pointed out, it's really important that that we uh, are following these privacy rules. Uh, but that also that means that the knowledge sharing might becomes much harder than it would otherwise be. And this is something that we have to embrace this uh, that issue. And and I think in general, these networks are needed for sharing knowledge, uh, sharing best best practices and, and, and so forth. It's just necessary part there if we want to go really move on with this theme. Uh, the question is then why we need even more collaboration. I, I think this is really cannot be underlined more, uh, enough. This is uh, this is hard. This is definitely harder than survey research for sure. And you simply cannot do this all, all of yourself. So this is one thing. And the other thing is that this uh, technology has changed. We have artificial intelligence and the, and the knowledge accumulation is happening faster and faster. So it makes also innovation much harder than it used to be. So it makes sense also to join forces in innovation. Maybe we get something more out of this. And also, I mean, these collaborations, they are occasionally also more fun than working on yourself. As a final thing, I want just to say kind of reminder why this collaboration is also important. This is a picture from our Mapinec Madrid meeting from January. And I, I think this is a good to remember that the initial idea of academia, and I think still is the idea of academia, not only covering universities, but also the entire research communities. It's, it's, it's the idea that it's a global community of scholars, and we have to embrace this uh, principle in general. So that's my everything. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ani, Yanni. And with this very nice presentation, we'll now move to the breakout rooms. You see uh, in the bottom, if, can you see the on the bottom of the screen the, the four options? Or do you see also a list of unassigned people? Unassigned as well. So you you need to scroll down, scroll down your your yeah. with your with your mouse, and then you see the rooms, and you can click on join. And you bring bring it to the main room because it's a. I think it was a a very important point in this breakout room. So I will invite uh, all the moderators uh, to quickly share what you have been discussing, not to summarize all the presentation, but just like a couple of seconds sharing um, what was the takeaway message. And in our case, it, it has been a bit unfortunate because I had to leave uh, due to tech, technical issues. I had to leave during Marcos' presentation. So Marcos, feel free to step in. Uh, and we had afterwards the presentation of Domandas explaining um, the, the human mortality database, how they put together uh, mortality related data for all basically all world countries that uh, countries in the world that has uh, available data so i really invite you to to go to their website human mortality database uh, they also have the human fertility database and explore the richness of the data and and how they uh, really harmonize uh, cross national data in a very uh, professional way uh, which is a model for uh, different countries and including the United Nations agencies. So this, uh, uh, we finalize our session with a question from Roxanne uh, about the types of uh, documentation from different databases and how uh, documentation is not yet um, optimized, like in a way that it's not, the way document uh, database documentation is now, it's not sufficient. Uh, and Marcus was explaining that uh, he indeed uh, agree with that. And uh, the problem is, uh, and he mentioned that the problem is not only uh, the documentation itself, is that the documentation are, relates to the current state of uh, data and doesn't relate to the past. So the, the, the things that change over time and how do you build up um, time sequences, like the documentation for, Previous series is not always available, right, Michael? Something in this yes, direction. In a sense, I think Roxanne's question allows me to to succinctly summarize what I think are the challenges of of creating comparable data sets, and it, most of it really does boil down to to documentation, to document what has changed within countries across time, what is different across countries, 
um, in, in, in both the variables and the design of the data sets and, and so on, and how to provide sufficient context so that users can interpret whatever data they're using um, and provide further clues as to how to how to go further because of course every data set can't provide the encyclopedia britannica with a data set but but there has to be pathways which users who, who really need to dig into what the differences are um, can be found and and i think that presents a, a, a true challenge um, for for the creation of, of comparable data sets Thank you, Mark. Now, Elina, would you like to share what has been discussed in your breakout room? Yeah, so we had a breakout room on linking administrative and other types of data. So we had a presentation on, uh, uh, in particular, linking or building a longitudinal survey and linking that to administrative data, which is going on in here in Invest. And then a presentation on kind of extensive registry data linkages and also using uh, biobank data and, and kind of um, health data and survey data and link, linking those and also in particular using genetic information to recruit participants um, into um, health studies. Um, and so that both of those projects uh, uh, were really kind of interesting and really um, important advances in terms of um, linking data and, and obviously hark back to some of the um, presentations in the main main room that we had earlier on as well. So not only happening in Finland, but also in other countries, obviously. Um, and then at the end, we had a very brief discussion on, on how important kind of building trust and, and in having trust um, or keeping trust is when you're linking kind of um, information personally collected from participants to, to all kinds of registered data that we have from them and, and how kind of public acceptance um, is important uh, for both recruitment and, and then for kind of pursuing these kinds of projects. Thank you, Elena. Uh, Peter, you are the next one to summarize the discussions for us. Yes, happy to. Um, so this breakout room was about improving data accessibility and we had inputs from Jan Paula Heisig, who's a professor here in Berlin of sociology and works at the WZB Berlin Social Science Center as well. And Tina Hinz, who works at the German Federal Office for Migration and Refugees. Um, so it was a very specific perspective of the German case. And as a lot of people might be aware, Germany is a very diverse in terms of data accessibility. It can be very rich, it can be very difficult here. And um, Tina started by saying that there are a lot of improvements in the making. She said that Germany is at a good point and that uh, research data Act is in planning, and if it is passed, she said that very existential improvements will be made to data accessibility, including better uh, combin combinability is the word of data, um, and better access in terms of having lower or no fees at all for research data. Um, and then Jan proceeded to say that uh, he agreed that things are improving in Germany, but uh, they do so very slowly. And uh, he um, illustrated the challenges that researchers here face. Um, in two examples, one of which he described as a worst case and one of a best, best case example, the worst case is trying to research um, COVID cases uh, when there is 400 public health departments that collect COVID data every day. And the best case was the German Health Data Lab, which is currently bringing together um, insurance data from more than 90 German insurers. So there is a lot of different, uh, uh, there's a lot of improvements going on. Um, we then discuss what can be improved on the big scale in terms of data accessibility and also whose job it is to do that. And uh, Jan asked for a culture of data sharing to be um, instituted, uh, but also for a data sharing infrastructure um, and to increase public uh, acceptance. And he said that it is indeed everyone's job to do so and suggested also to improve the communication around the issue because not all people understand how big the issue is. Um, and then we had question, a question about uh, trying to access data specifically at uh, Tina's agency, uh, the German Federal Office for Migration Refugees from outside of Europe. 
um, and she stressed that there would possibly be challenges, but offered to help and get in touch. And we finish on that note. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Andreas, you're the last one summarizing okay. the room on ethics. Yes, uh, very shortly, because it's, of course, a very complex question and uh, uh, which touches, of course, not only data science and, and demography and statistics, but also eth ethics, uh, uh, lawyers, uh, philosophers and, uh, and more. So we discussed first that, as, as you could imagine, uh, you always need to weigh between public goods and individual rights uh, between purposes which are justified and uh, the fears, uh, particularly that that this might be misused, which are often only fears. It's not uh, often uh, also really shown that this is uh, justified. We talked about this um, uh, potential uh, that we have to take this into account, this potential uh, misuse uh, or misleading interpretation of data that uh, you might simply be accused for the wrong thing, uh, and who might who might be uh, uh, the potential. Um, um, uh, people, uh, institutions, so be it uh, commercial groups, be it, be it interest groups, uh, be it law enforcement uh, authorities, uh, which might uh, be um, uh, uh, the usual suspects in, in that regard. But this has really to, to be more elaborated. Um, uh, and um, uh, we talked a lot about also how can we, which uh, uh, is also comparable to what, what Peter referred, how we can really increase uh, the uh, trust of people uh, into uh, sharing the, the data. We didn't use the word data literacy, but I think it is also to be mentioned in that uh, context. So how can we make sure that people are more willing also to see the, uh, sharing data uh, and giving giving authorities which are um, uh, approved for that uh, access to, to data? Uh, we discussed about how can we create actually a secure data where you have security that uh, it cannot be uh, uh, data, uh, it cannot people cannot be identified per person. Um, and also, uh, what levels of information uh, individuals should have access to, if it's to their own purpose. So a lot of things which we could only uh, touch in, in, in the short period of time. Uh, but, but I think overall, um, uh, which is really necessary, is what already was mentioned. Uh, we should get this culture of data sharing, uh, that people uh, think more critically also about their fears about that, whether it's really justified. And we need perhaps really more interdisciplinary collaboration in terms of uh, defining rules, uh, given that we have new structures and new data accessibilities. Uh, and uh, that was almost what we got in, in this 15 minutes. Fantastic. And it's for four hours, one minute. We are just in time to finalize it. But uh, I don't want to do this before giving the floor to Yanni to conclude the event. Thanks, Daniel. And thanks for everybody for input. I think that's been really great. I, I think what kind of, kind of comes out of these discussions that, that, that we have here, I think that it's kind of obvious. Everybody wants to I mean, extending registered data uses is something that almost every, almost everybody wants to ha happen in in Europe now, but there's definitely challenges. I, I think one of the things are one one challenge is related to the legislation and privacy and ethics. Uh, there's a lots of happening in European level regulation at the moment, uh, but there is even more country level differences in how this regulation is applied, and this is something that is probably going to uh, be the case for lots of years forward. Uh, some of the these concerns related, especially privacy, there seems to be uh, they, they they are not necessarily that realistic. But but other concerns are that we have to we have to acknowledge this as well, as researchers as well. Uh, the 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 importance of building a trust is really kind of a crucial element here. Uh, what I'm big concern is that that when this uh, regulation is being built at the uh, across the countries, I think there should be more input from the research communities. And this is something that easily happens that the, the issues that are non-issues from research point of views come to dominate this, this uh, uh, legislation discussion as well. And then and I think that we have to be kind of active players there. Then there's uh, this accessibility uh, challenges, uh, which are also not only being able to, I mean, partially legislative, but also there's technical issues there. And I think there's this is an area where there's a lot of improvement happening also almost everywhere. Uh, but what we haven't really solved is, uh, I mean, we cannot really share the data that much, especially if it's a prior, uh, individual level data, but we can share lots of other things. Uh, we can share practices, uh, 
well, how we do the coding, just the analytical, methodological things and so forth. And, and this is something that I think even the even in the Nordics, we, we have done this 30 years now that we haven't really solved yet. And this is an area we should make a bit greater contributions everywhere. And finally, this is related to that is also the, the challenges in, in knowledge and skills. I mean, this is partially the documentation part, which is a, a challenge that is very hard to actually understand what is done in one country and what in another. And this is kind of something that prohibits co co uh, co uh, collaborations and, and uh, comparisons. Uh, how things should be interpreted, I think this is important. We should have kind of a, kind of a mechanism to kind of share the knowledge in that regard. But also we have to learn the skills. I think this is, we. it's good to uh, understand that these are not the easy methods, these are not the easy data sets, and it should be taught somewhere and I'm not sure we are really doing that. I said that this is another area where we should really put more input to. So this is my wrap up for things. Thank, thanks for everybody's input and, and, and that you have participated in this. Thank you, everyone. I hope to see you in the future again. Bye-bye.